I want to invite you to find Exodus chapter 12 in your Bible, please. And for those of you who do not have a copy of Scripture with you, we'll be putting these verses up on the screen. Exodus chapter 12, we're going to look at the first Passover during the month of April. Our theme and is Christ our Passover. We're going to be looking at God's greatest object lesson. And in order to understand this message, we have to go back to its origin. So we're going to go back to the book of Exodus. Many of you are aware that in Exodus chapter 12, it's the end of of God's judgment upon the nation of Egypt. He has now pronounced a tenth and final plague. And this plague was going to be devastating. It was going to be coupled or merged with death. All of the other previous nine plagues caused harm, problems, inconveniences. Uh, They were a nuisance. You could put a lot of different adjectives around them. But... None of it changed the heart. None of it changed the behavior, the attitude, the posture of Pharaoh or the people of Egypt. Now, keep in mind that Egypt in Scripture is a type of the world. So when we talk about God's object lessons that he gives us in Scripture, we're talking about him using a truth or an event that's filled with principles that Jesus would come and fulfill. And so we could say it was the preview to the main attraction. Before you, when you go to a movie and you're sitting there in your seat, prior to the main attraction, they show you the coming attractions. And types and shadows or object lessons that God communicated many, many, many years ago were forecasting and getting us prepared for... Jesus and him coming to fulfill all the types and shadows that God gave us. So as we look at this portion of scripture, I'm going to read, I'm going to sort of interject some thoughts, and then here in a few moments we're going to receive communion this morning. This is the first Passover. While the Israelites were still in the land of Egypt, They had not been delivered yet. Deliverance was coming, but they were still in the land of Egypt. They were in captivity. They were under the power of the the Egyptian people. The Lord gave the following instructions to Moses and Aaron. God always has a plan. From now on, this month will be the first month of the year for you. So God is causing a transition. He's saying, I'm getting ready to bring a change. And it's going to be such a dramatic change, it affects your calendar. It affects the way that you will mark time. This is, I'm going to mark time. Something is about to happen. You've been in bondage for 400 years, and you're not meant to live in bondage. You've been in Egypt. You've been under the thumb of oppression And you have now been taken advantage of long enough. I'm marking a new time for you. Announce to the whole community of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, each family must choose a lamb or a young goat for a sacrifice, one animal for each household, household salvation. God was going to provide salvation, deliverance, redemption to every family without exception. If a family is too small to eat the whole animal, let them share with another family in the neighborhood. Divide the animal according to the size of each family and how much they can eat. The animal you select must be a one-year-old male, either a sheep or a goat, with no defects. Perfect, spotless lamb. Take special care of this chosen animal until until the evening of the 14th day of the first month. Then the whole assembly of the community of Israel must slaughter their lamb or young goat at twilight. What a scene that must have been. When they came into the land of Egypt, it was Jacob and his family. There were 70 of them. Now there's millions. They've become a threat to the Egyptian people, so they put them in bondage and made them their servants. They built these fabulous cities for the Egyptian people. 
but they were weighted down with a burden and lost their own identity. They forgot that they were the people of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They were now oppressed. They were now pushed down. But there are so many of them. So many of them. They're spread out in the land of Goshen. Separated from Egypt, but close enough that they could commute and work for them every single day. But it was a completely different community. And so each family, each family was to offer a lamb. Or if it was a small family, a goat. Or they could combine families just so that enough could partake, enough could partake of this meal. That they were to prepare to protect and preserve them from judgment that was coming. Now over 29 times in the New Testament, Jesus is known as the Lamb of God. John, seeing Jesus, pointed and said, look, the Lamb of God who what? Takes away the sin of the world. And how would he take away the sin of the world? It was through his sacrifice. He suffered and sacrificed upon the cross. He gave his life's blood. Was he innocent? Was he spotless? Was he without defect? And the church said, yes. But was he sacrificed? Yes. Did he suffer? Yes. God is painting a picture for His own people to see that His plan is a perfect plan. He would send a perfect sacrifice. Jesus would be offered up once. And listen to this. The book of Hebrews says, for all. There needs to be no more sacrifices given. Once and for all. How many people in the community were told to prepare a lamb? Everyone. God has room for everyone. God makes room for everyone. God includes everyone. But everyone has to have what? A lamb. Everyone has to have someone that will take away their sin. Someone who's spotless, without defect. Someone who is perfect. Well, we know we don't qualify But Jesus does. And that's why He came. Verse 7. They had to take some of the blood and smear it on the sides and the top of the door frame of the houses where they eat the animal. Jesus said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have nothing to do with me. They thought He was talking about cannibalism. What he was talking about was partaking of him as the bread of life. He's the bread of life. Now, if you and I consume food, where is the food? It is in us. As they sat down and partook of the lamb, where was the lamb now? Outside or inside? He was inside. Paul said, it's Christ in you that is the hope of glory. It's not the event of Christ. It is the redemption of Christ. And the redemption of Christ is appropriated by faith. And you receive it by faith. And they had to receive this lamb by faith. Everyone would get a part or a portion of the lamb. Verse 8, that same night, They must roast the meat over a fire and eat it along with bitter salad greens and bread made without yeast. 90% of the time when yeast is mentioned in Scripture, it's in regards to sin or the removal of sin. So a week prior to this sacrifice of this innocent lamb, all yeast was to be removed from the houses of the Hebrew people. They were to go through and light a candle, and if they found any yeast in their house, they were to remove it. What is this? It's a time of preparation. They're preparing to receive. They're making room in their life to receive. The removal of the old so they can have something new. We talk about that many times. You have to get 
rid of some stuff in order to make room for new things. And so God is preparing his people for what he has prepared for them. God is always doing that. And so God sets the table, but we have to come and dine. And we have a part to play. And our part to play is by faith we do this as unto the Lord. Verse 9 says, do not eat any of the meat raw or boiled in water. The whole animal, including the head, legs, and internal organs, must be roasted over the fire. And do not leave any of it until the next morning. Burn whatever is not eaten before morning. These are your instructions for eating this meal. Be fully dressed, wear your sandals, and carry your walking stick in your hand. Get ready. It's going to be a brand new day. Eat the meal with urgency, for this is the Lord's Passover. On that night, I will pass through the land of Egypt and strike down every firstborn son and firstborn male animal in the land of Egypt. I will execute judgment against all the gods of Egypt, for I am the Lord. But aren't you glad? There's that simple word there. But the blood on the doorpost will serve as a sign marking the houses where you're staying. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. This plague of death will not touch you when I strike the land of Egypt. There was a difference between the Egyptians and the Hebrews, and the difference was the blood. When I see the blood, now, when they offered up this lamb, each and every one of them had to observe this lamb for a period. Uh, this lamb for a period of five days. So it was a yearling, without spot, without defect, and so for five days, the whole family nurtured and took care of this lamb and observed it. Was it an acceptable sacrifice? Was it the proper sacrifice? And then at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, at the same time, everyone stood at the door of their house with this animal. Underneath the animal was a basin that would catch or contain the blood that would be shed by this innocent lamb. And so at 3 o'clock, all of them sacrificed the lamb, the innocent spotless lamb that they were now endeared to. How many of animal lovers do we have here? If you've had an animal for five days, that animal now owns you. You are its pet, right? And so here this lamb is, innocent, spotless, without defect, pure, perfect. They look at it every day, not a wrinkle, not a spot, not a blemish, nothing wrong with it. They feed it, they water it, they take it for a walk. And you hear these, these lambs all over the land, hundreds of thousands of them. They take this innocent animal, sacrifice it. The first drops of blood fall into the water basin. It's mixed with water and blood. When Jesus was on the cross and they pierced his side, water and blood came out, fell at his feet. From this water and blood, they took a brush and hyssop and they put it on and sprinkled the sides and the doorpost of the house. And then they walked inside. And now they are protected, preserved, delivered. In now this sacred and safe place, they begin to partake of this meal. Whatever isn't consumed is burned, completely consumed. Nothing can remain. It was a perfect, complete sacrifice. Every part of it was utilized. And then that night, when the sun was going down, would be about 6 o'clock in the evening during this time of the year. The death angel was released and began to go through the land. Wherever the blood was not applied, judgment came. But wherever the blood was applied, judgment stayed. We used to sing songs, Are You Washed in the Blood? 
the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Oh, the blood of Jesus. You were not bought at a price, gold, silver, precious stone, not those items, but you were bought at a price, the precious blood of Christ. When we come to this time in our service, as we begin to partake in, of communion, it is a holy and sacrament that reminds us of a life that was given so we could all have eternal life, a suffering, blood that was shed. But before Jesus sat in the upper room and said, now I'm instituting a new covenant, just follow me for a couple minutes. He's marking time again. He said, it's a brand new day. You know, the reason that there's a difference between before Christ, B.C. and A.D., is because of communion. Jesus said, I'm changing a season in the world. The way you worship, the way that you can come to the Father, the way that you can be delivered, and it's for the whole world. It's not just for the Jews. But in order for us to partake and participate in a worthy way, Scripture asks us to examine ourselves. That's what was going on in this first Passover. As they were in this safe and sacred place in their own homes, they had an opportunity to examine themselves in light of this sacrifice. They didn't comprehend or fully understand the mystery of it. That would unfold as Christ would come and make these tremendous proclamations about His exclusive claim to being the Savior of the world. He was not a madman nor an egotist. He was a Savior who knew his purpose, that he was born, that he would die, so that we who are dead could live again. And this illustration we are going to begin to dive into in our upcoming services. All of the symbolism, all of the types and shadows. And I'll close by saying this. On this platform, behind me is my shadow. It's cast. It shows an image of something that is to come. I can walk into my shadow. And I can fulfill its shape. And so God did in the Old Testament. He threw a shadow of something that he was going to walk into and fulfill. And he did it in a way that everyone could understand and participate and benefit from it. He didn't leave anyone out. I love the way that most of us learn. Some of us learn through lecture, but most of us learn by participation. They participated in this. And that's what we're about to do right now as we receive communion. We get to participate. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. Whenever you do this, as often as you do it, you show forth the Lord's death until he come again. So this morning as we receive communion, I want you to know that God in the first Passover made room for judgment to pass over the whole world through Christ our Savior. He truly fulfilled everything that was written in Scripture so that we could have peace, preservation, deliverance, and redemption from God. And to God be the glory for that. Thank you for watching today's message. If you'd like to know more about today's message or the ministry here at Living Word Fellowship in Knoxville, Iowa, please call 641-828-7119 or visit us online at lwfknoxville.com. If you are in the Knoxville, Iowa area, please stop by and see us on Sundays at 10 a.m., or Wednesdays at 7 p.m. at 321 East Robinson, where there's always something for everyone.